What's going on, everybody? Welcome back. Uh, we are in the studio with Darius Fentress. I'm so glad that y'all are here again for another episode. Today we got a great one, but before we get into uh, it, I want y'all to subscribe to this channel if you haven't did it already. What y'all waiting on? Absolutely. Subscribe. I'm on Apple Podcasts now too, y'all, so go check it out there. But yeah, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. I want to continue to bring y'all great content in the studio. We have guests every week, amazing guests, and today is no different. Today, I got a friend and brother of mine who has been in the industry for so long. He is amazing. He's excellent. You know him as the drummer for Kirk Franklin, but he does so much more. <laughs> Give it up for my boy, Terry Baker. What's going on, Terry? What's up, Darius, man? Thank you for having us on, man. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be a part of uh, this experience and to just talk music and drums and studio and all of that good stuff. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, man. Man, I'm, I'm trying to think back to the first time we met. It had to have been... Man, early two thousands, at least. Yeah, I would. I I, I want to say it had to be. Was it at Bobby Jones? Yes, it had to have been at Bobby Jones. Had to have been. Yeah, I I mean, I I remember the first time uh, that I had to uh, a, a chance. You know, after Fred started to do uh, the Radical for Christ and all of those mm -hmm. those records. Uh, I remember the first time I met uh, our dear friend, um, uh, why am I Marvin, going blank now? Marvin the McQuitty. first drummer. Marvin McQuitty. Yeah. Uh, that was in Michigan mm -hmm. at a uh, explosion we were doing there. And then I think later on we met up. Uh, I don't know if it was in Nashville or Florida. But, yeah, yeah. We, we got to link up uh, – you know, after that, and uh, we just kind of stayed connected ever since. Yeah, yeah, man. Absolutely. I've enjoyed your work, man. Oh, thank you, man. Appreciate that. And you know it because you was one of the ones, you know, after a while, you know, I was like, I got to get Darius on some percussion with me on some of these records. And we started doing some things together. So, yeah. Yeah, man. I appreciate your contribution <laughs> to uh, uh, a lot of the records we were producing. Yes, man. We're going to get into some of that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. So, you know, you mentioned it. Uh, people may or may not know you were a long time resident drummer for the Bobby Jones gospel program on BET that lasted for so many years. Man, mm -hmm. you know, how, how did how did that come about? I mean, we, we go backwards of how you started and got into the industry and all that. But but talk about like your introductory and getting the gig for Bobby Jones and how long did you do that? Man, uh, long story short, uh, there was a group here in Kentucky at uh, Kentucky State that were called Victorious and it was uh, a male group. Um, they had the opportunity to go to Nashville to do one of the first explosions there. So I went with them and I just remember, man, I was sitting in the audience uh, this was my last year of high school. Uh, went down there, man. I was my mom. My mom knew that music was straight ahead. Like everything that I wanted to do was music, and that's where I was going. But little did I know uh, at that time I was skipping uh, school some days just to go down to uh, the college and be a part of that community and just really dive into the music because I had a chance to like co-write like I was doing a lot with them wow. uh so we go to Bobby Jones and I just remember we're sitting in the audience and we we're at one of the uh, am am amphitheaters there uh I can't think of the big amphitheater there um but they had a show there with the Clark sisters I think it was Milton Bronson, uh, just a lot of the, the staples at that time. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting in the audience, man, and uh, I was sitting there watching uh, them sound check. And I just remember it was a four piece band. Uh, and I was like, this is exactly what I want to <laughs> do. Yeah. 
like like everything about it was just blowing my mind. So last year at high school, I come back uh, uh, and graduate, finish that. As soon as I graduated, I called my friend up uh, that got us to Nashville. I was like, man, who did you talk to to get to Bobby Jones? He was like, man, well, one of the singers, you know, this is how we did this. So one of the singers that sings with Bobby Jones, that was my connect, blah, blah. I said, I need their number. Because I want to see if I can get an audition. Mm. So got the number. Got the number to Derek Lee. Oh, yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, I made the call. I was like, man, uh, uh, hello, Mr. Lee. Like, I, I noticed that you all don't really have a consistent drummer on the show. But I would love to come and audition and blah, 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 blah. So he was like, well, just the mere fact I've, I've – not had many people to call me and because such and such gave me uh, gave you my number I'm going to give you a shot wow so I my wife at that time uh we wasn't married though at the time but you know that was my girlfriend she wind up taking me to Nashville okay so she takes me to Nashville um Elaine is her name. That's yeah. my wife, Elaine. Shout out to Elaine. So Elaine takes me to Nashville. Uh, and at that time, I told him, I said, well, you know, I, I'm noticing on the same car, I said, I noticed that you don't really have a bass player, too. So can I can can I bring my uncle, which is a bass player? <laughs> it's like, sure. Both of y'all come down. We both go down, hop in the car, head down. Go in. They get ready to go out that weekend. We sound check. So when I get there, I'm already in awe because I watch these guys. So when I walk into this rehearsal hall, it's just it's one of those things where it's like, oh, this is how y'all rehearse. This is (laughs) this is how this comes together. Like y'all go to a rehearsal hall that has everything. Y'all do it at this level. Right. So, man, when I walk in and then the other thing that just floors me when I walk in, I was like, wait a minute, that's Mikey. Mikey (laughs) was playing guitar. He had just got there. I was like, oh, (laughs) no, this is, like, huge. Because that's like, this is one of my dudes. Like, I look up to this guy. So I'm seeing all of these people. Mikey just took it to the moon for me because commission and all that. Like, that's just... That's just epic. Like, it's just one of those moments I'll never forget. So, never got any music. He just said, y'all just sit down and y'all just pick us up. Mm. So, whatever they start playing, we start rocking with them. So, out of the corner of my eye, so we, we're playing. We, we, you know, going in, you know, Beverly Crawford and all of them was there. So, they wind up, I mean, they was churching. So, when they went church, you know, yeah. that church is up my alley. Right, you just went with it, yeah. <laughs> so, we went with it. So, I just remember looking out of the corner of my eye, and I remember seeing Ralph signal to Derek, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. He gave him one of them. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. it was like, they was headed out. He was like, thank you. I said, we'll be in touch, blah, blah, blah. So, I get back. Uh, it probably wasn't even a day. Uh, it was probably within within a days of hours, you know, the yeah. very next morning or something like that. Mm-hmm. He called me back and um, and said, I want you to go out with us, you and your uncle. So the next gig is such and such. Now, this is 1990. Wow. I am not even 21 yet. Wow. So... This is this is a point where now I'm I'm in the Nashville fire. Yep. So I am learning so much because the expectation and the level of musicianship there uh be, with those guys doing it every day. Like it's a daily, like mm-hmm. they get up at eight o'clock at the studio by nine, downbeat, and they do that for eight hours. Like that was blowing my mind. Mm-hmm. And at that time, in 1990, that's all Bobby Jones did was travel on tour buses. So tour buses, well, I was doing that in 1990. Wow. We were on uh, a 12-passenger uh, tour bus every weekend. 
every weekend. We was flying, going up and down the East Coast. I mean, every weekend. So wow. that was like those those moments, like I was doing that in 90. So, man, that's how I got to Bobby Jones. And then the rest is just like, man, that's, yeah. it's my humble beginnings, man, Doc. What a great launching pad, though, to be <laughs> – Connected to, I mean, the most visible thing in gospel. Music. It was the only. It was the only platform that gospel music had. Yeah. And you know, as a as a twenty year old, I didn't even. I wasn't even paying attention to that because for me, I just wanted to play. Right. You know, I just wanted to do music. So you know, when I look back now and I think about all of those, all of those things, it's just like, man, at twenty, like that is. That that was the only platform that gospel music had. Mm -hmm. Everybody came through Bobby Jones Gospel. That's yeah. how I met everybody. That's yeah. how that's how I began to work on a lot of these records because all of those people were coming. It wasn't, and the studio world was totally different then. It right. wasn't like it is today, as you see. Yeah. I'm set up right here in my house. It wasn't that we had to go to a specific studio. Yep together and track uh, it, we don't do that yeah. now we're everybody's tracking at home yep and and you had a time limit too because time is exactly money. exactly exactly so you had to learn quick yep. so that's the other part of recording that really i i began to get that that uh understanding and watch them talk that Nashville number system mm -hmm. and all of those things. And Derek Lee used to say to me, he said, uh, when I finish this, uh, this is how he talked. He said, baby, when I finish, when I finish writing this chart, uh, you better have that loop ready and you better be ready to cut this track. Mm -hmm. And I would just be like, oh, okay. So, so then I, in my head, I'm saying, so what does that really mean? Right. Because, uh, okay, I'm a timekeeper. Okay, I, I get that part of it. You know, I, I, I always try to make it feel uh, a great, you know, for someone to feel like they they bobbing and weaving with the, yeah. with the groove, you know, as a timekeeper. But on the other side of it, it's just like, okay, what is your expectation? Mm -hmm. so, so then it became the conversation of this is what I need. I need you to set me up. For the next section and i need you to be consistent between playing your snare and a, just playing the whole kit yeah. because everything playing loud and playing consistent is two different things right, right. and i learned that early you know because a lot of time playing live you just wailing yeah. you just you digging in and you never allow the mics to do the work. Mm -hmm. But then again, when you're in the studio, it's no, it's like, let the mics work. Yep. Like you, you can't, you can't beat the heck out of drums and expect them to sing for you. Like you take all the tone out of them. Mm -hmm. It's like, you gotta let the mics work, let the drums sing and all of that. And it's, it's all technique. That's why I used to love when I, I mean, only drummers that I looked at or at that time that I had to gauge by was the Joe Smiths. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Kevin Bronson and uh, yep. uh, Michael Williams. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, that was really it. Uh, and then later, uh, Jeff Lowe Davis came along. Yes, sir. But, you know, for real, for real, those were the only drummers. And when I looked at those guys, those guys was all finesse guys. Like, when I saw Joe Smith play the first time, even when he played live, it was like his left arm was glued to his side. <laughs> right. So it was just like, it was like that snare hit, it was the same thing every time. Yep. It was like he went around those drums like he was floating. Mm. And it was just like, oh, my God, like, how do you do that? Right. And you get the sound that you get. So I had to learn those things, which was really big. And it really started to uh, allow my sound take shape. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. So at what point did you move from Kentucky to Nashville? I moved in, I want to say it was like 91, 92. Okay. I finally moved down there. Um, I got an apartment and uh, actually 
true story, man. It's funny. That's when uh, I got my license, bought a car, all of those things. I did all of that stuff in Nashville. Nice. So um, I moved there. I had my own apartment. You know, I was launching out into the deep, but I was still coming home because it was only three hours away. Right. Okay. You know, okay. I would come home for church during the weekend and just, um, you know, live the life of uh, trying to be a, a session musician, you know, in Nashville during the week, man. Yeah. And, you know, when we wasn't traveling, you know, I was back at home. Man, and that that's a different kind of life. You know, you talked about it a little bit, but in because Nashville is so unique into itself. There's no there's no place like it when it in terms of recording and for people who actually go there to have a like you said, a nine to five that's recording music. I don't Absolutely. know anywhere else that's like that. Uh, so t talk to me about, you know, you learning how to ingratiate yourself into the system. Like who who were you with that gave you the opportunities to get on a lot of these records? And how was it in the studio? Like just from a technical perspective for you learning how to be efficient in the studio. I mean, everything, of course, it started uh, with Derek Lee mm -hmm. uh, with the session. My first big session was uh, Music City Mass Choir. It was a live record. Okay. Um, and uh, it was myself, Derek. It was pretty much the Bobby Jones band uh, uh, with Mike E on guitar and then Jim Long on guitar. And uh, that was my first big you know that was my intro into recording okay so with that before that though um uh, derek would give me his perspective as a music director the things that he needed what and and it really translated from live to studio for real for real mm -hmm. in his mindset because he was such a, a studio musician from a live perspective, he still kind of stayed in that lane. Right. Okay. But you still have a, have a little more liberty. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but the guy that was at Bobby Jones before me, that were doing a lot of the white records and all of the CCM records and all of those things that he was doing, country records and all that. Mm. One of the guys, his name was Steve Brewster. Okay. Steve yeah. Brewster was man a monster he was he was my template okay he was my template steve brewster was my template steve brewster was my template uh and i tell this story all the time but it's it's really it's really that story because he was the one there was a record that i was supposed to do for ccm ccm gospel artists that Derek was working on so i was doing it up until the week of Derek calls me he was like man the guy that uh is uh uh co-producing it which was the artist um he was like uh who is this who is this guy Terry Baker that you're bringing in on drums and he was like he's he works with me with Bobby Jones blah 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 he was like well you know this is this is one of those records that I feel that is it's a big record. I don't really know him. And I'm, not, I'm not saying that he can't do the job, but I don't want to experiment. Right. I want to go with something that I'm familiar with. Right. So me, I was like, okay, I need to go see who Steve Bruce did. I need to see what's happening so I understand how to navigate mm -hmm. through that. When I went, it, it was the best thing that I could ever done. Sometimes we allow our pride and everything else to get in the way and say that I can, you know, I should be, you know, and, yeah. and, and for me, it, it wasn't that. I said, I'm going to go and experience this. So I went and experienced Steve Brewster. So I go in and first off, walk in the studio, right? Long hallway. Mm. Walk down the long hallway, I see just cases and cases that say Steve Brewster, oh, Steve yeah. Brewster, Steve Brewster. Right. And I'm saying, wait, what are all these cases for? So I get to this third case. So one case is, I, I believe, was probably his just a drum kit. The next was probably a hardware and some other things. So I get to this third case, 
and it's probably about you know six to eight feet wide mm. because he had to open it up oh, right yeah, yeah, yeah. the big old trunk yeah big old trunk and it's just full of snares dang i said hey, why do you have 12 snares <laughs> at this session right you, I'm. I don't. I ain't even met the guy yet. Right. I'm just seeing the residue of of his gear right now. So then I go in. I see two up, two down. I see. I see everything triggered. Mm. You know, symbols at a certain height. Blah 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 blah. Then I see behind him a keyboard, a physical keyboard. Okay. And then over to the side was a rack. Pulled out of the rack was a drum machine and then a rack of modules and all of this stuff. Wow. So the drums was coming in, triggers, drum machine, he's ready to do that. You know, if he needs to change keys, he's doing all of that. Wow. I was like, wait, are you serious? This is this is my first experience to that world in Nashville. Man. So I watched him do this session and I was just blown away. I... I left that session so inspired. I said, you'll never, ever get me again. I went and bought, he because he had a Roland. It was the Roland, uh, the R8. Yeah. I went and bought the R8. I went and bought the Elises module. Remember the yeah. Elises drum modules yeah. that they had? Yeah. I went and bought those. I went and bought me a, a Pearl Masters custom drum kit. Uh uh, I went and bought a whole slew of pasties. Like I, I went and and you know at that time I only had like three or four snares, so my snare game still wasn't up <laughs> to par like I wanted it right, to. Right. But I went and got the trigger. Like I really tried to duplicate everything that he was doing, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the that was the beginning of it, you know. And after that point, uh, it really. After I did my first session, then I got connected to Sanchez. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because I was doing the tracking at Cut Above. So I remember going to meet Sanchez and uh, having the opportunity to work with him. So then he says, well, I'm getting ready to do this record with Albertina Walker in Memphis. Why don't you come and, and be a part of that? That was kind of like one of my first records. With that, and then the uh, Orlando Draper record. Nice, man. And after after dealing with that, Sanchez was the same way. Everything that Derek Lee said, Sanchez was the same way as far as his verbiage and what he needed out out of me. But then he gave me this. He said, "Remember one thing: everything that you play, it is forever." Yes. When it when you play on a record and that record goes to the world, it's forever. Yeah, awesome. So mean everything that you play and never, never, never leave the leave a session saying, "Man, I w I was it was too much." Mm. Like you you should never leave a session feeling like I either I played too much or I didn't play enough. Right, right. You know you when you listen back to it. It should, it, the, he said, allow the music to tell you what to play. Yes. And that's really what, you know, I really try to take from that model and really pattern myself out after. Of. It's like, you know, uh, one of the things is, you know, and Derek Lee, you said, you know, and, and I'm sure every musician out here that's ever worked with him probably uh, have heard this terminology, but. You know, when we you, we would do those records and I would have ideas and I would try certain things and he was like, yeah, 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 no, 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 no. Do that on your record. This is what I need you to <laughs> right. do. Man. Oh, oh okay. Do that yeah. on my record. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he said, because the people that are paying you right now, top dollar, to do this, they don't really care about that. Mm -hmm. They need you to do, they need you to be this guy. So when I start looking at it, I'm looking at all of these guys in Nashville. It's like they don't work as hard. And and they got a million dollars in their bank account. Right. 
It's like, what am I doing? I'm working way too hard. Right, right. It's like those guys walk out of there understanding that. At that time, you're talking about you could get paid. Uh, uh, you have single scale, double scale, triple scale. Mm-hmm. You know, depending on who you are, how efficient you are. For me, you know, starting out single scale, you know, it's like I, I want to get to that triple scale, double session. Yeah. So if it's if it's if it's starting out, it's one seventy five. So one seventy five times three mm-hmm. times two. Yeah. That's the guy I want to be. Yeah. That's how you get to a thousand dollars per song. That's how you you get, you know, up up to that that area and you start moving. You start calling those kinds of shots per song. Yeah. Like. I, I, you know, we, we, like, I think we got, sometimes we get our priorities uh, mixed up in what we're supposed to be and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And because at the end of the day, it's about, you know, really putting something out that is forever. Right. That you're proud of, that body of work that you're proud of. But then too, the other side of it it, it is handling your business. You got to handle your business, you know? So, you know, learning those things, man, listen, that's Nashville 101. Yeah. Be on time, know your music, have a sound, you know, all of those things. Listen, that's and and you'll go far, you know, within that because it applies everywhere. I don't care where you go. Right. Man, you are so right. And you talked about, you know, having your own sound. You walked us through uh how you you were inspired by seeing a level that you weren't exposed to as of yet. You get exposed to it. At that point, what were you doing to create your own sound that we know and love today? One of the things is I've always been an experimenter. And when I say that, uh, you know, taking my drums apart, uh, buying different heads to try to figure out, you know, why this head speaks like this and why this head Mm -hmm. speaks like this why is a single ply this sound and double ply this sound so that was the first thing Mm -hmm. uh and then understanding what i heard in my head because for real for real for me and what i learned through that experience even with uh after watching steve with all of these snares i really learned one valuable uh, uh uh concept is that you know, drums, a lot of time, toms, really, the heads give them different texture mm-hmm. and maybe different tone. But for real, for real, the character uh, and the tuning and the snare is really what changes the whole dynamic of the whole drum set. Mm. Okay. If you take, if I take this drum set that I'm sitting here playing and I put different snares on, mm-hmm. the whole drum set takes on another character. Yeah. Because you start, the drums really only start with kick, snare, hi hat. Right. So snare is a big, you know, the tonal quality of a kick drum is just low end. So, yeah. of course, you get different kind of boom baps with that. Mm-hmm. But as far as the snare, when you go from the snare to the toms, it gives it a whole nother color. Yeah. So in understanding that part of a, of how, you know, snare drums really change. That's why, you know, now I have so many snares around me. I understood, like, if I take this snare and put it on this kit, it's going to change the whole tone of the drum. Yeah. So I experimented a lot. And then some of the other traits, like doing some of these uh, records, working with... Um, like the Anthony Harmons and my Uncle Mike and all of yeah. these guys and Jonathan. With the rhythm section, you know, Sanchez always loved for the kick and the bass player and even sometimes when the guitar player doubles to be like on one accord. Mm-hmm. Like that was his funk yeah. kind of idea or his template that he loved. So I knew that was one side, but then two, with my splash work, why I have so, why I use so many splashes and why I have different colors with splashes, because I always heard uh, with the top part of a lot of the stuff that Derek and like uh, Danny Witherspoon, mm. and I'm naming these people because that's who we did a lot of those records with. Right, right. Uh, Big Mike Robinson, like their color, their right hand and the stuff that they did 
it was always splash work to me. Mm, yeah, that color. Yeah. So that began to shape and to give me context of why I use splashes mm -hmm. and why I love splashes is because I always heard that with ballads and all of that, those high notes and those motifs, they, I always heard that with this splash work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I, I did that. So that was a, a part of it. But really, you know, getting in the studio and the engineer saying, hey, man, uh, you might want to check that tuning. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear those overtones? And Sanchez was big on that. He was like, yeah. you, you don't hear those? Get those overtones out. Like, so that really made me start honing in on tuning mm -hmm. and making sure that I got that together. Then I started to meet different drummers. So I'm, I meet Chester Thompson. We're doing a record together. Oh, wow. That's a, We're doing Beverly Crawford's first record. Oh, wow. We did it together. It was, it, Derek produced 80% of it. And then there was another guy that produced the other 20%. He had a couple of songs on the record. But he brought in a different bass player, uh, drummer, and another guitar player. Mm -hmm. So, so I get to meet Chester Thompson, the Chester yes. Thompson, right. <laughs> and Chester's like, man. So, I'll so he's like, I'm cool. I'll use your drums. He said, if I use your drums, do you mind if I tune them? And I'm like. Okay, I was I was a little nervous because you know right. I mean every 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 uh, player loves their instrument to have you know their tones right, right right. So I took it as a moment. I said, let me see if I like it. And he was cool about it. He said, if you don't like it, you can tune it, you know the way you normally tune. But I would love to do a uh, tuned it kit. So my pearl. So he wanted ambassador. A clear. Okay. And that was I wasn't using Ambassador Clear. I was I was using the double ply mm -hmm. hand. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we get the Ambassador Clear. And when he started tuning, he went from the bottom first. He tuned that and all he did was get the wrinkles out. Mm -hmm. He didn't really even tune whereas most I'm looking like when I'm tuning drums, I'm looking for the note, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, no. Nah. He said just get the wrinkles out. So he went, got the wrinkles out, top and bottom. And when he hit the drums, I was like, wait. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, that's beside, that's not even a thought that I would uh, take on because, you know, I'm always looking for a note. But then, too, after I saw him play, he used a real, he had, he had, he used a, a longer a stick that, uh, tapered at the tip of it okay. so it was a little bit lighter yeah yeah you know what i'm saying so when he hit the drums go 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 like and his the way he played it made sense mm -hmm. that's when the light came on and says okay there's a relationship between drum heads tuning and the way you strike a drum yeah. so everybody thinks that that it's just all all heads. It's really not. Yeah. It's what sticks you use. It's uh, the heads you you choose. It's the way you strike the drum. All of that plays a part in what your sound is. Yes. So I mean the record. I mean I love that record and where we played and it worked for that night for the music, but it wasn't something that that I would choose to. Uh, take on for every project that I did. Mm -hmm. But I did learn how to get a certain sound when I need it. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So he taught me something in that and it really gave me a broader picture of how the interaction between your strike, your feel, the drumstick, the head, the drum, all of that stuff yeah. and, and how you get those tones and all of that good stuff. So that was a that was a learning experience yeah. as well in that. So that's really what kind of took me into uh, uh, creating my sound. I wonder, like, now, because it's, it's so much talent these days. Like, we just talk about drummers, right? And especially, okay. like, in the gospel urban music. You know, there's yeah. so much focus on 
chops and, you know, just the speed and fitting a lot of notes in the one moment. And mm -hmm. me personally, I don't, I don't feel that there's much treatment in how, how much people actually care about how they sound. It's more so what they could do, but not how it sounds. Like, how do you, as a drummer who you've kind of seen a lot of different phases and, and, and work with a lot of different artists, and how do you keep yourself relevant in, in this day of what people expect, but also stay true to what you know is your sound? Well, I think one of the things is, is you, for anybody, I, I think you, you you do yourself uh, you hurt yourself more than you help yourself when you try to be somebody else mm -hmm. first off right so for me it's like i listen there's a lot of guys that you know when i'm scrolling or whatever and i see different clips th the difference to me sometimes is because the first thing i'm looking for or not really looking for but my ears catch is when a drum is really speaking mm -hmm. to where I hear the clarity of what it is that you're doing to me for a lot of these guys. And I won't even start naming sure. names, but uh, cause there's a, there's a couple of guys that I would name uh, that I feel like when I hear them do something that I appreciate what they do because I can tell the consistency of their sound. Mm -hmm is a big part of what it is that they do and they get it. Yeah. So for me, it, it, it's paying attention one uh, and really staying in tune with what's going on today. Mm -hmm. Like I could never really uh, stay in the moment of not understanding like some of the feels and some of the, uh, the uh, grooves that, that are in the world and in, you know, uh, the music business today is like, you know, sometimes, you know, when people hear a hit, you know, most of the artists, you know, a lot of writers, they always trying to chase that next hit. Right. So for musicians, I think it's, it's the same way. I, I keep my ear, uh, to the, to the ground and I, I pay attention to what's going on out there. Yeah. And then I stay consistent to what it is that I do, but, I don't go outside of what got me to this place. Yeah. Because if they want that sound, I'm like, yes, call that person. Call, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah don't yeah. don't call me for that. Yeah, because that yeah. ain't that ain't that ain't that ain't that ain't what I'm about to do. Yeah. So I'm gonna stay right here, but then too, whatever I do, I'm going to push the limits of myself to stay relevant. Mm-hmm. You know, in that and and everything that I do, continue to make sure that it aligns with what God is having me do. Because, you know, in this day and time, a lot of times when we go out of the will of what God and the path that God has for you, right. then you mess yourself yes. up. So for me, even even being at Bobby Jones and playing with Kurt and all that, everything I've done up to this point, I'm sure... There's been many people that say, why is he doing it? I, because that was my path. Yeah, exactly. That's what God had for me. Right. So for everybody that is is trying to figure it out, listen, that's what God had for me. Mm -hmm. And what you need to figure out is what God has for you. Exactly. So that's the only way that I stay relevant and I stay in a position that I stay on the path of staying consistent. You know, I got to do that. Yeah. There's still a sound that you're always going to hear out of my drums. There is still a feel that you're always going to hear from me. Yeah, sometimes you'll hear me stretch every now and then. But it's like sometimes it's that. And, and my brother Sam always yeah. says this to me. It's like when I'm working sometimes, why I like to sit, well, why I like to have him record me with some projects or rather than me record myself is because a lot of times for us, we're our worst critic. Yeah, so right. for me, I'm trying to do this, 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 this. And then a lot of times it's like, he's hearing it from a feel standpoint. And he's saying like, dude, that, I mean, it, it might have a little, it don't have that quite quite, but it, it the feel of it right. is, yeah, it, it feels, 
feels right. So, and it takes me to like working with Kirk Franklin. Kirk Franklin was the same way. Kirk Franklin was about the feel yes. and not so much of, you know, the, uh, what do you call them? Uh, uh, it's not a dynamic, but the, uh, oh, shoot. Uh, the consistency of how you play it. Right. You know, all of those things that that that's around that thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was like, I just wanted to feel great. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's like laying back and it gives it this sloppy or whatever that may feel feel like for you. But it's like, I love it. Yeah. I love that thought. Yeah. I love that thought. So keep that. And, uh, you know, it's and, and, and with every artist, it's like that you work with, you know, sometimes you just got to make sure that you walk in with their mindset and not your own. Yeah. And that's really what it backs me up to, because sometimes we get in the way of making something feel good by really trying to, you know, perfect you know what it is, right. and we take all the life out of it. We make it sterile. Right. right. Sometimes, and it's it's funny because Sean used to talk about that. He's like, "Man, I don't want that. I don't want that sterile sound. Like, I want that. I want to feel it." Yes. And sometimes you got to understand where that line is between feel and sterile. Yes. You know. Absolutely, man. And man, you you are a great example, man. I just think thinking back at the times I've gotten to witness you, like in person. Uh, cut something like uh, I remember when you guys were doing the Hello Fear, uh, like the live portion of that album, um, mm-hmm. which ironically I got a chance to come on the back end and play percussion on that album, which was a great honor. Wow! Uh, but man, I was just like sitting back watching y'all, man. Like y'all, it just sounded so amazing, man. Like the way your drums sound, the way you approached everything. If y'all had to do another take, how consistent you were from take to take. And man, it was just great. And then getting a chance to actually record with you for that Joe Pace album that you yep. actually, you produced that album, I believe, right? Yeah, me and my, me and my brother Sam, we co-produced that yeah, record man. with Joe. Yeah. That, that was a lot of fun, man. So much fun. Uh, I, I had a blast working with y'all, you and your brother. Uh, shout out to Sim. Uh, Talk, talk to us about your partnership with your brother. How how are you guys and what are you guys doing these days and how you're recording, how you're taking on projects and like, just walk us through that. Man, I, I, I would say this, you know, um, for a lot of years, you know, you know, in family dynamics, you, you try to figure out um, how that dynamic works. And... Um, it took us some time to get through the uh, the stage of understanding uh, which one of us has the lead mm-hmm. in certain areas, but that was the maturity of even our relationship and uh, how we work together. Mm-hmm. And it really built such a bond because, you know, we fought, we figured it out, we got it together, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and now we realize we played to our strengths and understood you know okay so in in our process of working let's let's say working on a on a project sometimes a lot of uh uh sometimes it's it's me sitting together um let's say with the country artists that we're working with right now mm-hmm. so that's kind of like one of the current things that we're doing so when we sit and we work on this project I'll sit down and go through the music, begin to uh, create the music and and put it together uh, in a way that he can understand where we're going. Mm-hmm. So then once I get it to this place, vocally, I have a say so of how these things work. Musically, after Sim gets it, he has the say so of this part of it. Mm. So it's kind of like, and then we come back together and we figure out, okay, okay, yes, yes. Well, let's let's meet halfway here. So we had to understand how that works, even with production, because we do more of that now. Where I mean, we both started in Nashville, uh, and on a production level, like Sim is the is the guy 
that wants to understand how everything works. Mm -hmm. When I say that, uh, why the cameraman does what he does, what the engineer does, uh, that side of it, the the people that are on the other side Mm. of the wall, whereas I'm the artist side of it, the guys that are sitting here creating, which he's a creator too. But when you have someone on both sides, then we both speak the same language when we understand how we both get to the end result. Right. So it makes sense. Mm-hmm. So he's sitting on that side and I'm sitting on this side of it, which makes us to be this force and how we work together. And that's that's how it's been. It's like during the pandemic, you know, at the church. You know, uh, I painted this room like this room was all brown. We had to go to creating content, which was no no deal in my head. It's like it's a no brainer. Right, right. It's like I'm getting ready to go put it up like, OK, so what do I need to buy? Yeah. I need to buy cameras. I need to do this. I need to do that. And that's what we did. He did the same look at his house. Yeah. So that when we do things, it's like there is we 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 align. Yes. Consistency, so, yeah. It, yeah, it's it's all of that, man. Yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> you know, I you know, we cash the vision on the artist side, production side. He says, OK, this is what we need to do. And that's how we work together, man. Uh, we working with some uh, country artists. We're getting into a little more of that now, Good. Uh, going back to Nashville and all of those things. Nice. And, you know, uh, during the pandemic and even still up to now, you uh, you know, different working on different work records from here, doing different productions video wise mm-hmm. and creating different content, all of that. So we're doing all of those things, man. It's it's been it's been really great to be in actually to be in Dallas at this moment. Yeah. Because this city uh uh has a lot of creativity going on. Yeah. And it's it's great to be in a place to where it's people doing the same thing, and it's a lot of it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's a lot of the same energy. So, yeah. you know, we embrace that. But, you know, Sim is that guy. Uh, he's making sure, you know, when we do the drum sample series and all that, he's making sure the tones is right. Nice. Sim is making sure the video is right. Sim is making sure all of those things, production-wise, are together. I'm on this side on the artist side. So if you had to say it, he's a production side, I'm an artist okay. side. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, man. I love that dynamic, man. You know, working with any type of family is all can always bring some sort of challenge, but man, when it's right, it's right. And Yeah, it, I, and I think, I think I you know, a lot of the people that I've, the brother duos that, you know, the guys, uh, that we've watched, you know, through the years and the family dynamics, I, I, you know, I wouldn't trade any of that yeah. uh, because it's always um, uh, uh, such a powerful thing to understand that, you know, when we link, we're more powerful together mm-hmm. than we are separate. Right. And when we understand that, when we lock, you know, we can, we can, we can take down and accomplish some great things, man. And yeah. that's, uh, God has really uh, uh, given us, you know, the platforms and and put us in all the rooms to be able to mm. do some big things, man. And I'm grateful for that. I wouldn't, wow. I wouldn't walk the path with anybody else, man. That's that's my dude. Between between that and you know, both of us, you know, we're we're both family men, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, that's that's how we grew up. So. Yeah. You know, and coming here, coming to Dallas, yeah. we came here together. You know, his family, my family. That's how. That's how. You know, that's how God aligned us. Yeah. You know, and it's it's been a, a great thing to watch him. You know, order our steps and put us in different positions to a win for the kingdom. So I'm grateful, man. man. We're both grateful yeah. for that, man. That's amazing, man. Both of y'all are, are a blessing, man. And, and you talked about the places that God is taking you, you know, the saying is, you know, your talent will get you in the door, but your character is what keeps you there. And I, I, Mm -hmm. and and you Terry, from what I have observed over the years has, you've always been a man of integrity. I, I couldn't find anybody who could say anything about you that's disparaging. 
you know, that not to say that you're perfect or anything, but your character speaks a lot. And, and I, I just want you to talk about how and what it takes as a professional musician in, in and out of different environments, traveling the world, going to studio sessions, interacting with people. How do you keep yourself um, for being a consistent person all the time? How do you do that? Man, you know, and let me let me first give this disclaimer. You know, I am not perfect. I am not um, a man without, you know, some some flaws. And I've done some things that I'm not proud of. But I think at the end of the day, you know, none of us are. Mm -hmm. uh, and we all have a story and we all have uh, someone to answer to, um, you know, when that when that when that time comes. Yeah. But one of the things that for me is just always, you know, treating people how I want to be treated. Mm. That's the first thing. And I always knew that, that just, if you want to call it a love language or whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that's a really a giver and the guy that may, me and my brother are, we'll give, you know, things away to allow somebody else to be great. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things, not because um, we're expecting a whole lot back, but because that's what God told us to do. Right. Uh, and, you know, that has been the core of what it's been throughout, you know, our whole career. It's, it's like, you know, we get things, and and God says it's not for you. It's for you to bless somebody else. Mm. And at the end of the day, treat them how you want to be treated. Yeah. I've watched artists and people misuse musicians and everybody that's connected to them. Mm. And I think I've seen those things because, you know, on a larger scale, sometimes we only can, well, the larger scale is is really sometimes we don't really look at because we don't know where God is taking us. Right. We only know what's in front of us at the time. But even on a, a small scale of where you are sometimes, you have to be faithful over the few things mm -hmm. so that God can continue to bless you. And that's what always uh, has driven us. That's what that's driven us from day one. Mm -hmm. uh, giving back, uh, making sure that I impart into the next generation. Uh, here, take this, come over here, get this drum set. You know, and sometimes, you know, sometimes, you know, it, it, it's it's rough because, you know, sometimes some people don't see the value yeah. of that thought process because they're just looking at themselves. Right, right. And But you pray that, uh, you know, that they'll get it one day, you know, and understand what it means for uh, you to treat me like you want to be treated. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. And then too, you got to realize some people just, it's just the way they are, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, but here it is. We fight against flesh and blood. Not, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness and yeah. all of these things. And, you know, you, sometimes you got to look at a person and, you know, if you stepped on my foot and I would say, OK, did Darius re really meant did he mean to do that right. or was it just an accident? It's yeah. like it's like you got to really take all of that into consideration and really, you know, we have to be men yeah. and women that open your mouth and you talk yeah. and you say how you feel and we can agree to disagree. Right. And it's okay. Yeah. The one thing, like I said, Derek said, do that on your record. So in walking into some of these situations, I had to say to myself, okay, stop, stop, stop jumping in so far. Mm. Because, okay, I'm a giver. Yeah. So, and I'm the guy that wants to be all in when I'm into something. Yeah. But then, too, it's like God is saying, no, that ain't what I gave you. This is not your ministry. Like, you're only assisting 
and while you're here because I still have something else for you to do. So you can't you can't put yourself in a position to think they're going to do what you would do. So when wow. I figured that out, wow. then I stopped, you know, looking at that as mine and taking ownership in something, somebody else's ministry and somebody else's artistry and all of those things, because it's not mine. Yeah. So, you know, those things, I think that's at the core of it. You know, one, keep God at the forefront, understand what you're dealing with and never put yourself in a position to take ownership in something that doesn't have your name on it. Wow. If you remember that, you know, you'll keep yourself, you'll keep away stress and everything else. Wow. You'll keep all of those things at bay when you figure that out and understand that. And that's that's the mm. very thing. You know, those it's it's simple. It's it's simple. Kirk Franklin is Kirk Franklin. Yep. Joe Pace is Joe Pace. Bishop Jakes it's Bishop Jakes. Yep. Terry Baker, I can take ownership in that. Yep. That's me. That's my name. You know what God, yeah. the, the things that God has me up at night writing and thinking and the creativity that he's given me for a time that I really don't know when, mm. but he'll show me when it's time to do it. Yes, sir. And he'll, he'll, he'll let me know. And, and it'll be time for me to do that at that time. Mm -hmm. But you got to realize all of these people, you know, we are not who we work for. That doesn't define me. That ain't never defined me. Exactly. Matter of fact, the reason why you called me is because my character. Yep. Absolutely. So it, it, even with Kirk Franklin, it, when we started, when we started to work, I, re, I remember I went out on, we went over the seas and, uh, uh, when we was working on that rebirth record and it was after that. And he said, man, he had to, he said, I have to apologize to you. We got, we, after a break, we went and took lunch. He said, come ride with me. So got in the car. He's like, man, first I had to apologize to you because I defined you for what you did with Bobby Jones. Mm. But this producer was saying, no, he's much more than that. That's what he does there. Mm -hmm. So after you come in, you've never heard this music and you just played, you just gave me what I needed for Brighter Day. Like, yeah. okay, so I let me, let me apologize to you as a musician first for putting you in a box. Then when we go out on the road, he said, man, your character and who you are and your spirituality is what I need mm. yeah. here. Yeah. That was his exact words. Wow. And that's when, and I told him at that point, because God was taking me through, I had told my Achilles and God was taking me through a place and I wasn't really traveling, mm. uh, you know, at that time. And I told him, I said, man, if I, if I, if I was to go out on the road first, I got to consult God and I got to take this to my family uh, because it's what it, 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 it's, it's more than just me mm -hmm. that comes out on the road. Like everything uh, from who I am, the godly man that I am and what I strive to be, you know, even through my mess ups, you know, it, you understand what that is. And then my family is everything to me. So if they don't sign off on it and that was something early on in my career that I never considered. Right. Uh, I didn't I didn't consider how it would affect my family by just taking on gigs. Mm -hmm. I was I was taking on gigs to uh, uh, thinking that I was meeting the need, uh, the financial need right. of my family. Mm -hmm. And I really wasn't paying attention to what God was saying, because God was like, I've been trying to give you everything that you asked me for. Mm -hmm. But you keep you keep making a decision to do this and to do that. And I keep trying to pull you away from that wow. because I have something greater <laughs> set up for you Man. and you keep making this decision. So for all you musicians that continue to do it on your own and you still trying to figure out why, why, why am I in this place is because of your own selfishness and everything else that you put before God. Yep. That's why. Yeah. 
I was sitting there, man, and I was like, man, when he when he told me that, and you know, it's like, man, God is 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 that dude. It's like it's like I, I hear people talk about having a relationship with God to where you can just talk, mm -hmm. just like me, you having this conversation, right? But to have this kind of conversation with God, and He answers and He speaks back to you, and sometimes it's a slap, and sometimes it's this. Uh, uh, but you get an answer. Mm -hmm. And when he was showing me all of that, he was like, Terry, it's like, it's me first and, and your family. Yeah. This affects your family. This affects your wife. This affects your children. You being gone affects your children. Yes. You being gone affects your wife. And I, my grandfather used to say this to all, all, all the time to me. He's like, when I would come back off the road and he's like, he said, you you you, you taking take care of your wife. You, you taking care of your family. You, you taking care of your wife. You take taking care of your. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, Granny, yeah. But see, I'm thinking, I'm I'm financial. Yeah, I'm all money, of these yeah. other things. Mm -hmm. And he's speaking on a whole nother. He's speaking on a whole nother side. Right. right. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like, man, it's like, yeah, it's it's a lot of things to consider. But when you Put it in that order. My mom said that to me all the time. She that was the first one of the first scriptures she gave me. And all that ways acknowledge him, yes. and he'll direct your path. And I say that on every interview mm -hmm. because it, it is true. And then sometimes the devil tries to make us liars in that in that place, mm -hmm. you know, because we think that because we get a call from X, Y, and Z that that's from God. Right. No, right. no, no. No, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't give him credit for all of those things right. because you don't know what's on the other side of that. Yeah. Sometimes on the other side of that is your destruction. The things that you struggle with, the things that you fight and you walking yourself in a position mm. to go down a rabbit hole, to walk into your destruction because you feel like. You know, this is this is what I want to do. Right. Like, I want to play for such and such. Right. I want to do that. And you never know. You never consider what's on the other side of it. Yeah. Yeah. And for years, we've done that. Years, yeah. For years, a, we've done that. It's a real thing. You know, there's a lot of people that have that, and they don't, they don't understand that it's because you took, excuse me, you took in and, and uh, went down that path, and you chose to do that. Yeah. It wasn't God. It wasn't God. So, you know, we got to be very careful, you know, and for me, that's the only way that I can do things now. You know, it, it has to be, you know, in that order. Yeah. You know, God, what do you say about this? And then I go and talk to my wife and say, what do you think about this? Yeah. You know, and then, you know, me and my brother have a conversation. What you think? Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, outside of that, nothing else matters. Man, that this is wisdom, man. So much wisdom. And, you know, as we wrap up this time, man, um, if you have any other lasting uh, advice, anything you want to say, you've given us so much already, but I, I just feel like there, you know, there's people out here that really need this, man. The people that are, are listening to this podcast or watching this podcast uh, are going to, really be blessed by your life and what you have to say. And so just leave us with, with some lasting advice, man, that can help somebody who are in a position where they may have some opportunities that are looming that they may think is God, or just, just take us out with, with, with the, your wisdom, man. Man, wisdom, wisdom teaches me is to have a relationship with God, our creator. First off, mm -hmm. Having that relationship gives us access to so many things that we sit up and think about and cry about in those times when we're alone and we have a moment to ask God why or to say, God, I want. Mm. And the thing about it is what you have to do is just seek God first. Seek him first. Why? Because from the foundation of the world, he already knew what was in us. Mm -hmm. He already knows what's in you. So what you have to do is begin to align yourself with him. 
He's already given you the gift that was a given. Mm. He put that in you. He already knew you. Mm. He already knew what you were going to do. What he wants is for us to lean to him. He wants us to have that relationship with him. All the creativity, all the things that you have, that's from God. He already gave you that. When you realize that, then you can have that conversation and understand what is the next step for me as a as a musician, as a writer, as a production guy, as whatever gift God has given you. When you understand that and you have that relationship, then he'll begin to just, you know, write it all out. You'll you start seeing it open up for you mm. because it is his will. Like it's, 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 it's and, and I, for some people, some people wouldn't say it that way, but it's like a dad. It's like a father. Mm -hmm. It's like those of you that have children, like when your children come to you and say, dad, I would love to have such and such. And, you know, most of the time what we do is we say, well, did you do this? Yeah, you did, yeah. did you do that? Did you do that? Did you do everything you were supposed to do? Guess what? I got you. Mm -hmm. So and it's the same. It's the same kind of relationship. That's how God is. But on the flip side, God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. God. God is one. Even through our flaws, mm. he begins to protect his investment in us. Yeah. When we mess up, oh, that's good. when sometimes yeah. we don't call him like we should. I'm grateful that God has been for me. He's protected me and he's covered me and he's kept me from certain situations that I knew I was not going to be good yeah. uh, 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 in that situation. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So first off, have a relationship, align yourself. He's already giving you the gift. He's already giving you the tools that you need. After that, the sky's the limit. Yes, sir. I, I, I can't give you nothing else. <laughs> right. Because that's all I had. Right. You know, one of the things I can go deeper and, you know, people talk about, you know, all of these things that you got to be to be a great man. Listen, you can't be something that ain't in you. Exactly. Character, all of these things, walking, being on time, knowing your music, uh, knowing uh, what. Uh, uh, tools to take on a job just like with anything else like all of those things should be a given yeah. study your craft yeah god study your craft yeah study your craft whatever it takes for you to be great and then when you study your craft you begin to create your own sound you begin to understand who it is you are never take yourself outside of the parameters of who God made you. That's good. We always yeah. stretching ourselves. I ain't even talking about that yeah. because he equips us for what we need in those times. Just like he said, when you open your mouth, I'll speak through you. Right. When you sit at that keyboard, when you sit, put that, that bass on and you play those drums, like he'll give you what, but you have to pay attention and you have to make sure that you are aligned with him. Yes. And you understand it's for him. Mm -hmm. Him alone. Some of us are able to walk through certain doors and minister cert to certain people because God has given you that was a part of your assignment. Yeah. Now, I'm speaking on another end because my assignment has been over here on this end. Mm -hmm. My assignment has been some country music. My assignment has been gospel music for the most part. My assignment has been Christian music. My assignment has been uh, uh, a little jazz at, at times. Mm -hmm. But but it was never to a place that I've, I've, I felt that it was offensive to God. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I'm not going to say that that's everybody's testimony. Right, right. I'm not going to take everybody because he went into the, he went in the gutter mode. He went out into some dingy places. Mm -hmm. Some of us have that and some of us are able to do it. It just wasn't me. Yeah. And I have some friends that do that and that are able to do that. Why? Because it's a part of their assignment. Yeah. Because they're operating within what God has given them. Yes. And they can be a light in the middle of all of that. Mm -hmm. That's what you got to remember. You still, wherever you are, you still got to be a light. Exactly. 
If you're not being a light, then what, what we doing? Yeah. What we doing? How they gonna know who you are? How they gonna know that you're creator? Yeah. So if I have anything, because kids are coming out, and listen, they coming out. I, I, I mean, I, you can pull up a clip right now, and these kids are just exceeding everything. And you know what? They're supposed to do greater. Yeah. That's the other part we don't talk about, yeah, Darius. They're supposed to. It, yeah. It's like every generation is supposed to do greater. Yeah. I tell my kids, it's like, you're supposed to do greater than me. Do you realize what you've done so far? Yeah. Like, you've been to places and you've done things that I didn't do at that age. Yeah. Because you're supposed to do greater. So, in all of that, stay your course. Mm -hmm. Keep God first. Study your craft. Yes, sir. Man, thank you, man. That's amazing. Terry, can you tell the people, man, where they can find you on social media? Uh, any projects you got going on right now you want people to know about? Let us know what you got going on. Man, it's 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 it's, it's work, 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 work. It's it's, it's things uh, that are, are out there, and you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I talk about. Well. You know everything that I do, but there's 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 projects going on. Uh, I'm on IG Baker Tr One. Uh, I am on Facebook Terry Baker. Uh, you always know me sitting behind a drum set or uh, uh, something like that. Uh, but uh, you can always uh, uh, see me on different records. We're working on some country music right now. Uh, and we're working on, or we just did, Anthony uh, Evans' new project. Oh, nice. Uh, there's some music coming out with uh, Joe. Uh, nice. Joe as in Joe, Joe not gospel. Yeah. Joe, Joe Thomas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, sir. So that was one of the things that, you know, uh, we had a chance to uh, work on a lot of his uh, new music, probably about 20-something songs. Oh, man. Ooh, so yeah, we've just be been good. writing. So there's there's other things. Those some some big things. Kirk Carr's new record, of course. I'm nice. always still working on uh, uh, getting ready to leave tomorrow for some Kirk Franklin dates and nice. all of that good stuff. So you you'll see me out there. Uh, just uh, keep God first. Yeah, you know, man. I ain't really got to talk about all of those things. <laughs> you know, I don't really like to, but right. You know, God is doing miraculous things. I'm I'm grateful for the uh, uh, shepherd uh, that I'm sitting under right now, and I always uh, want to call out uh, uh, my pastor, Elder Gershom Morrison. Yes, sir. And here in this city, my pastor is uh, Pastor Quinn Slaughter. So you can always see me at the Sabbath Church on Saturdays okay. at 11:45 at Rama Tabernacle. All right. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely man thank you man i appreciate you man y'all everybody go out please support terry and everything he's doing follow him on his social media and y'all if y'all are not subscribed to this channel do it you see absolutely the 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 nuggets and the wisdom that you got today i couldn't i couldn't pay for this it's, it's so so good so please subscribe please hit us up on apple Podcasts. We got more and more great content coming. And Terry, again, man, thank you so much for this time, man. I'm blessed from this conversation. And um, I'm just praying that, that you would just keep going higher and higher in what God has for you and for your family. And blessings to you. And man, just thank you. Bless you, man. Thank you, Darius. Yes, sir. It's, it's been fun, man. I, you know, I, I don't take it for granted. And I'm I'm always in a posture of gratefulness for every door that God opens and for every platform that he allows me to open my mouth and talk about him and what he's done in my life. So I appreciate you. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, y'all. Well, until next time, y'all be excellent in everything you do and keep God first. Peace. Absolutely.